So there were similarities in two kings and the gospel of Luke. Both these foreigners were cured of their leprosy from afar. Elisha had to ask Naaman to dip himself in water, but Jesus merely had to speak it and he was cured. The other thing I noticed was that Elisha means God is my salvation and Jesus means God saves. So in that sense, the context is the same. There's someone from the outside rightfully knowing that they need to approach the people of God, a person of God for healing. Elisha prefigures Christ. I think that's also shown in, in, in the fact that Naaman, upon being healed, returned to Elisha. And the word that stood out to me is that he stood before Elisha. Yet the Samaritan in the Gospel of Luke, when he returned, he fell. Uh, some readings that fell, prostrated, bowed, threw himself at Jesus' feet. So again, kind of for me, I took that visual to kind of understand, okay, yes, Jesus is some, something greater. Uh, than Elisha. One thing I liked that you mentioned was the whole idea of distance in both readings, that in fact, uh, Naaman had come from, you know, geographically many, many miles. And in Luke's reading, part of the religion, right, that because the 10 lepers, they were, they had to be physically separated. But distance definitely played a part in both. Naaman got connected to Elisha because of a servant, a Jewish servant, right? So I'm wondering if part of the dynamic between Elisha and Naaman was impacted by the Naaman's status, and he didn't recognize the authority, read power, of Elisha until after the cure, whereas the 10 lepers approached Jesus with the expect acknowledgement that Jesus as a healer, could do something for them. But that idea of, of distance is interesting, I think. And if you extrapolate it a little bit, the uh, second King readings ends with Naaman asking for some actual dirt to take back with him, because in Old Testament times, in Hebrew scripture times, various gods were associated with specific places. Many religions have holy places, this idea of of holy ground. So Naaman wanting to actually take back some of the dirt, I use it as, as I prayed with it, I was thinking about Naaman staying connected with the place of his healing. And if you internalize that whole thing, it, it is a way um, to be reminded to be actually, oddly enough, grounded in this healing that he experienced at the hands of Elisha. So literally the dirt grounded him in that experience. What you brought into my mind was the idea that Naaman, he had to go and search for God and God's presence, healing. But in the gospel reading in Luke, Jesus, it seems, came to the people. He came to where they were. And I feel now kind of when you were speaking about Naaman, taking the soil, I feel like he was trying to capture a bit of God for himself because naturally he had to go home and continue his day to day, but he wanted to have like a reminder or something of God with him. And I feel like in the gospel, Jesus is showing how God is now everywhere and he, he's now present. So that idea of us trying to find, search God, and hold on to God, that little kind of peace interaction we may have with God, a certain revelation that Jesus is saying is proclaiming that I am actually searching for you. I'm actually uh, making that journey so that I can be so near to you. And you only need to hold on to Jesus. Absolutely. Naaman wanted a connection to the place of his healing, because he recognized the holiness of that. And in the in the gospel pericope, then, as you said, it is as though God intersects with humanity in Jesus. The point of contact of the divine with creation is the person of Jesus Christ, right? And so that that plays out in all of Jesus' public life, I think. I, you're absolutely right. I think Naaman wanted to stay connected. And that's another important word to think of, because when I think of connection, I think of relationship. 
And that's exactly what is the point of the kingdom in all of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and Pentecost event. The movement was always be connected and do something with it. Do something with it. At the end of Luke's gospel, doesn't Jesus say to the Samaritan, stand up and go. So we're supposed to be connected, related, but then we're called to some to do something with that relationship. But the whole idea of the importance of relationship in how we interface with the divine cannot be overestimated. I think that Jesus broke all the prohibitions, right, that blocked relationship, who not to eat with, who not to touch, where not to go. And he breached all those big gaps because communion was everything that he knew in his divinity and wanted us to reflect because that is how we image God. The entire gospel reading, Luke chapter 17, verse 11 to 19, dealt with movement. So it first started with Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And then it said after he had cured the 10 lepers, he had mentioned, go show yourselves to the priests. And even though the Samaritan came back, Jesus said, as you mentioned, stand up and go. Your faith has saved you. And so I feel like the point, as kind of everything is alluding, is not to stay in this moment. There, there's something further. And I think both the nine lepers, Samaritan and Jesus, can't stay in this moment. They have to continue. So Jesus continued to Jerusalem, Calvary, crucifixion, death, resurrection. The nine lepers are going to the priests, but I don't think that's also the end point for them as well as the Samaritan. The Samaritan, it could be argued, went to the priest in Jesus. I, I could think of it as the Samaritan bypassed the current day established priesthood and saw something that the other nine didn't see, which is the actual priest was Jesus. And Jesus gave him the order, go. Now, where, where does go actually mean for that specific Samaritan and the nine lepers? That's a different thing, as we can also interpret it for ourselves. Where is our specific journey in following Jesus to Calvary? It's different for each one of us. Everything is not evenly sequential and very ordered in this life that we call faith and the spiritual life. It isn't a controlled process. It's a surrender to mystery. And if we do it the way the Samaritan leper did, we can only have these realizations if we're constantly engaged with reality and not if we have blinders on. I think it's also significant when you're speaking of the metaphor of journey that Luke specifically says, as they were going, they were cleansed. We make the way by walking, don't we? We could easily make the mistake that we're supposed to put down roots and, okay, well, I'm not a leper anymore. Well, okay. I think that's one of the things we're being invited past in this. What I find interesting is the lepers, were they all healed at the same time? Or was it that the Samaritan was the only one that could notice it? Because it does say that as they were going, they were cleansed. And one of them, realizing he had been healed, returned. So I wonder if even as the other nine lepers were going to the priests, they never realized they were healed. In our journey in faith, we may be continuing, progressing, but not realize kind of like the miracle that's happening in our lives. And and it it takes a a certain type of uh, sight, a certain type of vision to realize that and come close to God. Because if not, we can, you know, uh, go through the uh, day by day things of morning prayer, Sunday mass, whatever it is in our journey, and I realized the miracle already happened. And from that, we should already have a certain excitement, joy, gratefulness. We do often restrict healing or joy or growth to physical things. You use the word sight. It's an attention paid, isn't it? Which helps us to realize That section in Luke almost sounded liturgical to me. Realizing he returned, glorified God, and thanked him. Worship is a sacred duty for all of us, a sacred duty, a sacred obligation. And the root of that is 
connect. We stay connected to God in one way through this sacred work of praise and thanksgiving that we owe to God. I was listening to you say that how easily we can be dulled into rote repetition of like morning prayer and so on. And yet it's a dance, I think. The things that we choose to make part of our life ritually are ways that can hold us open so that our our realization never stops. And we can absolutely just get very rote about it, but we don't have to be constantly reinventing the wheel either. Being faithful to this sacred work of praise and thanks and, and embracing the going out and doing something. If you're faithful to those things, I do believe that there'll be an enormous and profound growth. Yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think the way I now want to clarify that is as long as these rituals or habits don't become the ends, that's where we can have clear sight. You know, sometimes we do need the church building. We do need a certain habit praying, but it cannot be the ends to our means, which is essentially approaching God. The, the devotions that may be part of our personal spirituality, those devotions are never the end. God is the end. In, in the second reading in Timothy, near the second, in the second half of it, if we have died with him, we'll live with him, we'll reign with him, die with, live with, reign with. My point here is with, with. It's all relational. At Naaman bringing the two mule loads of dirt. It's a way to incarnate his gratitude to the divine for his healing. Now, granted, he was thinking of, well, Elisha's God did this, so I'm going to take the dirt from the country that Elisha's God is associated with back with me. It's a primitive thing, but if you if you move it forward, we're still talking about the same thing. It's the it's the with, 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 with. And that isn't narrow. It isn't narrow. It doesn't just happen at Sunday Mass or when I say the morning offering or when I go to confession. It happens at those times, but it's just wildly all around us. And that's the that's our charge, I think. Stand up and go is pay attention now, you know, realize it and be part of what I read as liturgical. Realize, come back, glorify, thank. That's liturgy. And it isn't happening only inside church walls. Adding to what you you just mentioned, actually, is that the community part of it, we, when you're we're referencing the second letter to Timothy, if we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we persevere, we shall also reign with him. It's not saying I. It's talking about that communal part I've always come back to. And in connection with the gospel reading, Jesus asked, where are the other nine? In a way of looking at it, why couldn't all 10 of them come back to Jesus? Why couldn't it have been done in community? But what if Jesus is saying, go, your faith has saved you. But what if the mission is go, bring back the other nine? Because it's not just about the one person. It's about the entire community, the entire world. It's, it's about the work of Christ, which begins with Jesus journeying to Calvary. But Calvary means he's bringing everyone along, people who have illness, internal, external illnesses, and people on the, on the fringes, on the outside which I guess encompasses this uh, specific group of 10 lepers. And so he's inviting them all to come along in the journey. But he wants them to do it at their own pace, at their own understanding, and as a community. It has to be in community. 